So these thickets of symbols. The central focus of my talk today is going to be this sentence from Merton's journal in 1964. He writes that if I advance into these thickets of symbols, which I think I know, I will find myself lost in what I do not know, and that perhaps I will find myself different and walking in a new way. And so he's talking about advancing in space and time towards myself lost, myself different. And I read this as that self lost, self different is allowing us to approach that inward stranger. So there's going to be three sections to my talk. I'm going to start out with um, that phrase, the symbols which we think we know, and I'm going to use the thicket as, as a symbol, as an example, since it's right there in the sentence. Then I'm going to talk more about the full journal passage that this sentence um, is within. Um, Merton is reading Jeremiah. He's talking about the Abbey of St. Gall. He's talking about scribes copying out this very hard emotive imagery from Jeremiah. Um, and then the third part, I want to talk about the ways uh, Merton does what he's talking about here, how he pushes himself to walk in new ways and advance into his known symbology. And certainly Dr. Thurston's talk on Wednesday night um, was a great setup because I don't have to talk about silence and solitude. I can just talk about the fruits of that. Um, and one more little caveat, I did talk to a friend about this presentation before I gave it and she said, is this supposed to be a scientific paper or a meditation? And I said, well, that's the great thing about the Merton Society. You can do a little bit of each. So you'll see I've, I've gone a little bit in both directions. Hopefully um, you'll get something out of that. So let's start with this thicket, the symbol that we think we know. A thicket is a particular type of natural place situated in space and time that is home to a dense cluster of shrubs or trees. Most of us have had some type of experience with what we think we know as a thicket. Um, however, in the past few decades, use of the word thicket has begun to vary regionally in the United States. So in Texas, big thicket became one of the country's first national preserves. It touts creeks and bayous meandering through nine ecosystems and a diversity of carnivorous plants. In Michigan, the northern shrub thicket is a particular wetland ecosystem defined in the natural feature inventory, dominated by, dominated by shrubs and saturated rich soils, particularly along streams and beaver flooding. In Kentucky, the cover thicket is an area less than one quarter of an acre that densely co is covered with shrubs, briars, and young trees. And the cover thicket is recommended um, for planting for landowners who want to provide wildlife extra protection from extreme weather and predators. So overwhelmingly, a thicket is describing a place designated um, as a particular type of wildness that merits preservation, protection, and promotion, but various strangers might certainly have differing opinions on what the particulars of that wildness might be. Merton was actually quite a fan of thickets. I didn't know this before I started writing this paper. And he expresses through a series of passages in his journals and poetry exactly what a thicket means to him. In 1940, while visiting Cuba, he describes a view from the road outside of Camagüey in his journal as, quote, dense tangles of uncleared thicket, not jungle, but just completely impenetrable brush about 12 feet high. The stuff seems from the road to be so thorny and so tightly interwoven that only some small animal the size of a hedgehog could get in and out of it. It would take all day with a machete to go a quarter of a mile through the stuff. It is literally as close as a fence all the way around. So it's kind of helpful for the reader that Merton describes his concept of a thicket so thoroughly and so early in his writings with what would become a consistent emphasis on the physical effort required for movement to occur. Merton um, continues the use of the thicket metaphor, but in the, in, um, for following one's own vocation in 1958 with a journal passage about his community. Quote, but I wonder more and more to what extent a genuine and deep spiritual life is going to be at all possible in such a community. No question, of course, that the individual can maintain one on his own, but in order to do so, 
he is going to have to cut his own way through the thicket and not just follow the community. At least that is my case." End quote. Three months later, while fighting a fire in the woods, Martin, record, Martin records finding part of the fire rambling aimlessly through a thicket of sumac. I tried to do the approved thing and build a backfire, but it was a waste of time. The job was soon over. The parallelism between the individual in the thicket and the approved action outside the thicket being a waste of effort in these two passages uh, shows a clear consistency in message. And I just wanted to di digress one moment here because this day out fighting fire in the sumac is one of those kind of magical days in Merton's journal where um, all sorts of things are coming together. So it's the Feast of St. Joseph. He's sent out to fight a fire in the sumac. Um, he's thinking about the proved versus wild approaches to solving problems. Um, and if you look up sumac, um, there's a lot of um, indigenous medicine and herbal lore associated with it. Um, and he's got all this in his mind, and then he starts talking to this little girl um, when the fire's out. And he starts associating this little girl's voice with both um, the racial problems of the day and the sound of a bird. So he has all of this going on. And, and um, at the end of, his, of that passage, he says, I've been with proverb. Um, and I was kind of struggling with the language of how to describe this kind of event that, that happens to Merton every once in a while. And I was really moved by that, just the discussion by Glenn uh, Loughry um, about the Aboriginal experience and what he calls the high context way of seeing and whole body listening. And I just feel like so many of these times when Merton uses this word thicket, there's so much awareness of the present moment to feel all of those threads and be able to really articulate them. Um, so that was my little aside. Um, Merton also uses thicket metaphors in his poetry. A couple examples here um, in his translation of Tungshan, a cuckoo wa urges all wanderers to return home, calling, quote, in the thicket of the wood. And in Cables to an Ace, section 73, um, when he's lured into, quote, the rusty thicket of wires where nothing is tame, there, Merton finds love has hung itself in the wires that he might eat of winged food. Um, in a later journal passage, Merton records traveling one of the oldest roads in Kentucky, getting lost for a while and being surrounded by a, quote, wild thicket for five miles and more, commenting that this is how they traveled in the Middle Ages. And finally, in a Midsummer Diary for M, Merton describes, quote, a lovely doe in the woods behind the hermitage. At times, dogs come and chase her. Yesterday I saw her and them. She leapt into the open without seeing me, looked around in distress, then bounded off into another thicket. So Merton's persistent use of the thicket metaphor across decades allows the reader to glimpse into his internalized spatial and nature-based spirituality. A thicket requires exertion. It affords food and protection while querying the traveler as to his or her willingness to move toward wildness. Poetically, Merton's thicket represents a home apart from the mainstream and a home to the fire. It is both shelter to gentle hearts and the path to the impenetrable abundance that is the stranger. The abundance represented by the thicket is aligned with traditional and indigenous teachings in direct contrast to the scarcity consciousness of modern Western, Western civilization fueled by greed-based consumption. So now I'm going to step away from this thicket for a little while and talk about um, how Merton, the context for this quote and, and what else he was thinking about that day. And the images are going to shift too. So because um, the readings from Jeremiah were focused on this burnt mountain, um, I've got pictures of the mountains and volcanoes that Merton specifically mentioned in his, uh, during his Alaska trip. So that's going to be the background images for this part. So Merton begins that broader gen, uh, journal entry with a passage from the Judgment of Babylon. Um, and I didn't quote that all here, but he comments on the incomparable sound of the Latin text. And he mentions his recent readings regarding the Abbey of St. Gall before copying out another verse from the Doom of Babylon written here. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountains, says the Lord, 
which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt mountain. In reference to these passages, Merton co comments, quote, what a spiritual discipline must have been the copying of such texts. And he talks a little bit about repetition. So think about, you know, yourself kind of repeating this to yourself. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burnt mountain and make you a burnt mountain. This scribes repeatedly writing this out. Two things might have influenced this comment about the copying of text. First, the book of Jeremiah has been called a scribal artifact that speaks to the vocation of writers. In Chad Eggleston's book on the topic, See and Read All These Words, he says, quote, the tradents of Jer Jeremiah dwell not only on writers, but also on the writing process and the variety of texts that they produce. Although this particular passage from Jeremiah didn't mention the, the scribes or the writing process, Merton certainly would have been um, familiar enough with the prophet to, to have that um, subtlety in the background. Second, Merton's sensitivity to scribal life would have been heightened by the minutia detailed in his reading that same day of abbatical successions, famous monks, and major events in the history of the Abbey of St. Gall. Um, that book also contains the daily schedule, the monastery um, grounds, the layout, um, and then details of the immense number of volumes that were written by the scribes there. There's one direct quote in that book um, from a scribe, Edbort, who certainly would have spoken to Merton in his vocation of a writer. And Edward uh, reminds the reader in um, the Codex, St. Gall Codex of Collectio Canonum Ebonensis. Um, Those who do not know how to write do not think that it is labor. It is true that only three fingers write, but the whole body toils. And this full body workout, right, is exactly the type of effort that Merton suggests for this penetrating quest of self-discovery, the exertion required for the thicket described in the rest of the passage. Um, Merton continues his process of working through Jeremiah with a stream of consciousness passage that reveals the direction of his thought as he, as he continues to contemplate this burnt mountain. So there's more here than comparison of Babylon and a volcano, more than prophecy of a moment of cataclysm. In the cataclysm is revealed the inner nature of the mountain of plagues and poisonous snakes. A valid replay, only another poem and other symbols in the same tone. Meaning what? More than one knows. What turning from this morning's Lectio? And so how does one undertake this whole body toil necessary to advance into the thicket of symbols? Merton reads and he writes and he pursues the hidden more that approaches a revelation of the inner nature of the symbol. Um, he also reiterates that, that scribal repetition. He says, quote, this must be dared with patience and belief. For after reading some of it once or twice, one ceases to believe that there is more, and this is the danger. And this kind of message corresponds um, to that of the useless tree, one of the poems in the way of Schwanza. I was thinking about this because Merton translated it around the same time. And um, they both kind of follow this idea that what appears useless, such as the burnt mountain that God makes a permanent waste, or this distorted stink tree in the poem, always has more, right? More uses beyond what is easily consumable by humanity. All right, so back to this uh, last section, the inner secret of the ground. I'm just going to read this original quote back over again so we have it in our minds that if I advance into these thickets of symbols, which I think I know, I will find myself lost in what I do not know, and that perhaps I will find myself different and walking in a new way. So for this section, I've used images from Gethsemane and also some places referenced in Lagrare. Merton used ecological symbols and those of the physical landscape to denote living action. In and it's evident throughout most of his writings from the Seven Story Mountain all the way to the Asian Journal. Through continued use of geographic nomenclature and in keeping with that repetition descriptive of scribal discipline, Merton develops a sort of symbolic gazetteer, if you will, and pushes himself into the impenetrable density to find the stranger in at least three distinct ways. 
And I would say these are ways that we too can explore the depths of, of the symbols that come up in our ordinary lives. Number one, he immerses himself in the natural spatio-temporal context of the landscape that surrounds him. Two, he deepens and expands his previous work with symbols in art and poetry. Um, three, he uses his method for finding the stranger to establish common ground for dialogues of peace. And I'm just going to mention each of these really quickly. First, Merton's frequent use of symbolism of the natural world and symbolic association of places in his own physical landscape puts the inward stranger at the center of the processes of physical geography and contemporary ecological crisis. Those familiar with Merton's journals are well acquainted with the, the mental symbolic map of Merton's world in his later years, the unconscious wood behind the hermitage, um, Monk's Pond, the Derby Day Place, Edlin's Valley, and his tracing of the movements of clouds and stars and wildlife through that landscape. And this ties in really nicely with what um, Kathleen Tarr was talking about yesterday about pilgrimage and as she called it, uh, finding the spirit of place in a vow of wonder. And I think really Merton focuses on that spirit of place and maybe even kind of sets up some pilgrimage sites for himself. Um, when not being without being allowed to go anywhere else, he can set up these these places that really resonate with him. So these then are the places, the ordinary places that he begins to think he knows as, as a hermit and as a forester. The danger as he describes it is in staying in those places without moving forward. Um, maybe not making the pilgrimage, right? In Kathleen Tarr's words, remaining positioned in ways that we have previously understood ourselves. Our protection of our true self is to turn to the transitional and in-between spaces that seem impenetrable, the thicket and the burnt mountain the wild places within ourselves that we have yet to acknowledge. With every passing year, the future of our planet too is found to hinge more and more on the critical, in, on the critical importance of the mostly hidden and often ignored wild bits of the planet. It is precisely the species and habitats and alternatives to consumerism that are not yet known that express an opportunity to find a different collective trajectory. And I think this, um, Dr. Prevost's talk last night um, where he mentioned environmental justice themes in, in the discussion afterwards, really tying with this. The earth itself becomes present in that action in truth and metaphor, um, and back to the quote, more than one knows. So in, in contrast to Merton's spatial symbology at home, his journals, and at home in his journals, his longer poetic texts, like those that describe the mythic place Le Grere, emphasize interpersonal communication and the distance between hearts of individuals. And I hadn't looked at the imagery or maps of the places that he mentioned in Le Guerre before, um, but especially coming from these images of the lushness of the thicket and the majesty of the mountains, these images of Le Guerre are really stark. Um, they're certainly beautiful in their own way. They're not any less holy, but certainly Merton chose them because I think of this broader feel for geography. So that was kind of interesting. That was something fun for me. I hadn't seen some of these before. So in Lagrere, the name of the country itself references forests and for foresters and forest dwellers. And there the inward stranger is met in the thickets where anger and competition, consumerism and over-reliance on infrastructure are key catalysts in the culture of violence. The stranger is present in every failure to recognize the fundamental human worth of the individual. Only the embrace of the present time can be antidote to disconnection. So that connection and journey between hearts is repeatedly modeled for us in Merton's letters. And that's been described in detail in um, a lot of papers by Fiona Gardner and others in the Merton Annual. And so the more that is not known and must be constantly searched out is an acceptance of the unfolding events in space and time as forming a symbolic trajectory forward toward the other. Merton's poetic dive into Le Grere has even more meaning if we, if we consider that Merton could have pondered a valid reply to the readings of Jeremiah. And in, um, in Dancing in the Waters of Life, it actually says a valid replay. And I tend to think that might be a typo because if, it, if it's reply, I think it makes a little bit more sense. A valid reply, only another poem and symbols in the same tone. 
meaning what more than one knows. So if Merton's only valid response is indeed more poems and symbols of the same tone, finding the stranger self becomes a poetic and artistic obligation. Legraire becomes a mirroring of the prophetic symbols of Jeremiah with tonally appropriate symbols of the present day as a response and a responsibility. Finally, Merton's final address in Bangkok builds on the language he established in that original journal passage that I shared from 8, 1864. So I'm gonna shift our perspective again to the end times of Merton's life. Um, he's just coming from Kanchenjunga, a very different kind of mountain than we've seen before. Um, and he doesn't use the word thicket, but he does talk explicitly about a mandala awareness of space. Um, that's certainly clear in Le Grere when he's writing about Tibetan patterns of life. And he also writes out a passage from the Crest Jewel of Discrimination on that same day when he's, when he's thinking about um, Tibetan Buddhism. The knowledge that we are all Brahmin is like a fire which altogether consumes the thick forest of ignorance. Um, and in the discussion, the quote, the quote that I've got here in, he is from a discussion of the similarities in the Buddhist and Christian monastic view of reality. He's telling the conference participants in his talk right before his death that, quote, if you once penetrate by detachment and purity of heart to the inner secret of the ground of your ordinary experience, you attain to a liberty that no one can touch. And I just want to point out how similar the, the spirit of that quote is to that quote from 1964. Um, so advancing into the thickets is here named penetration. Leaving what you think you know is called detachment and purity of heart. And the abundance of the unknown in our known symbols has become clearly named the inner secret of the ground of your ordinary experience. The self lost, self different, walking now in a new way has been recognized and acknowledged as liberty. 